He'll spill your tray. He'll drop when he picks up your stretcher. It's two to one, you flop. You're sick, but quick, get out of sight. The disorderly orderly's on duty tonight. He'll bounce your bed and split your splint. And though he's got you screaming, he never gets the hint. You might as well give up the fight. The disorderly orderly's on duty tonight. He'll try so hard to please you. But if you need an ice pack, watch out, he'll freeze you. The lovely nurse comes to the door. Our hero says, excuse me, and crashes through the floor. You must admit that he's polite. The only or is on duty tonight. Hello! Welcome to Movie Umpers. My name is Bob Sham. I'm Angela. And the sound here may be dogs. And all month long we have this theme we're calling Awkward Laughter to the Flop. A lot of modern comedies or from the late 90s, early 2000s that didn't do so great at the box office or did not hit that expectation. We're re-examining them several years after the fact. But there are three Mondays this month in which we're discussing a trio we're discussing a trio of movies. That's three Mondays. That makes a trio. <laughs> by a fellow by the name of Jerry Lewis, a man who made money. We're discussing three movies from his post-Martin and Lewis era. And uh, he's kind of our spiritual mascot of the month. Even though he didn't make that much, many flops. Though he did see maybe near the end that the day the clown cried would be a pretty interesting flop and someday we will never even released right someday we will no never a library i gotta call the library of congress uh next month i think and and harass them about or i'll just be a scholar i'm a scholar i would like to come and watch the uh uncut footage of the day the clown cried please mm-hmm. and uh maybe i can get that done but until then maybe you have to apply for a library of congress card yeah is that a joke? <laughs> I don't know. What if you could like, get could a library be of real? Con- you might have to do some kind of thing. Like you might have to like apply to be able to go there and watch it. I, we I need to look into this. Or let's look into what exactly they do. I, I think it's just a great national archive, essentially, right? Yeah, and as long as you're not taking anything out, you should be able to look at anything. Sure. Yeah. And what if there's a restricted section? What do you think they would have in the restrictions Porn? restricted section? Turn it or, or golden age porn. So this is my first <laughs> official introduction to Jerry Lewis through his movies. I didn't grow up watching his movies like you did. I grew up uh, with the weird images of him, clips of his movies, him having a pint glass in his mouth, which I always found funny, and then being like angry. And yeah, he probably wasn't that. He wasn't a great guy to his kids, right? He beat his kids, but you know when he was beating his kids. Shit was zany and nutty as fuck. Probably no one beat their kids funnier than Jerry Lewis. Not Bing Crosby, not Frank Sinatra, nobody. Bobby, Bobby, you know that was not funny. And this is just another case of what we've seen. I mean, we've seen this through the years, and it's just very sad. I mean, that some of the funniest people are also either, like, the saddest or worst. Yeah. You know? I got to They're not always bad, but if they're not bad, they're fucking sad. I just displayed a, a dark sense of humor a moment yeah. ago, and I I can say that there is um I would say that humor can stem from insecurity, and it can be a healthy way to get that out or at least what, how you grow up, the environment you grow up. Yeah. A little bit of like an emotionally isolated latchkey type kid who spent a lot of time by himself 
and, and sh- yeah, I was a clown. Mm-hmm. I was a little clown growing up. Mm-hmm. And that definitely stems from a sense of solitude. And I bet Jerry Lewis had some weird issues himself growing up. That's how you kind of become that. Uh, funny people have do have some dark shit uh, yeah. on the back end of their brain. A lot no of doubt. times it's a coping mechanism. And you really got to concentrate on doing the best you can to try to at least be a little bit of a better person than you were before. Or else if you have that, you get into the funny business and then you become wildly successful and famous and rich then you that could easily spiral into you being one of the worst fucking people ever. Corporal punishment was very common back in his day. He if if he's beating his kids, that means he probably got his ass beat all the time when he was a kid as well. <laughs> the zaniest. So we know the legacy of Jerry Lewis. We've been discussing it all week, all month. Uh, we see we see it in TikTok videos. We see it in children's programming. Certain characters that we've uh, let's see like a. Like your Jim Carrey's uh, Tom Green, Freddie Got Fingered. Kind of like a Melissa McCarthy, even. If sure. Trying to think of a lady yeah. that comes closest because she just does very, like, physical. Sure. Sort of wacky. I'm thinking of the movies that we've seen of hers, <laughs> and it, they're ridiculous. Tammy. Uh, yeah. The one where she's a spy. Man, that, that spy scene that where they scene give her where her they purse the, full of. The hemorrhoid cream and I she's did laugh like why does it have to be hemorrhoid cream you you laughed a lot at that scene so that was a long time ago <laughs> that is the one melissa mccarthy scene that i did laugh my ass off at yeah yeah but what is the what what inspired jerry lewis himself you know he he was he came up like a lot of these actors little kid in vaudeville uh looney tunes like this mm-hmm. is this feels like the most looney tune of of all the the Jerry Lewis movies we've discussed so far, a lot of that classic slapstick that leads up to where he is now, yeah, and he becomes this focus point of this very specific goofy nutty style, and in this movie it is almost like I won't say this was so much more funnier than the ones we've watched before, but I through this movie in particular I had I gained this weird fascination with the id of Jerry Lewis like yeah. what he is and why he does what he does like I'm getting used to him now and it just looks like he's like a weird chaos god that is too stupid to truly understand that he is an actual chaos god it, it's almost like god is punishing this establishment this hospital by placing a Jerry Lewis here mm-hmm. like someone in that hospital is being punished by God, and that is why Jerry Lewis is there as a little chaos deity to to change something because someone on earth did something wrong. Katie the cook. Kathleen Freeman. Plays his supervisor in this one, and she would argue that it's her. That she's the one being punished. She might be. By his presence. Or the administrator. The administrator loves him because was in love with his father. This movie's called The Delicate Delinquent. No, it's not. (laughs) The Disorderly Orderly. From 1964, directed by Frank Tashlin, written by Frank Tashlin, Norm Lieberman, and Ed Haas. And starring Jerry Lewis, Susan Oliver, Glenda Farrell, and Kathleen Freeman. That's very interesting that he did not write or direct this at all, because he did with the last one we watched. This movie is essentially like a absurdist comedy. Yeah. There's things that happen in this movie that are not physically possible. This is why he, an a, in like our a, reality being a chaos deity makes sense. Yes. Also, I love how this movie just gets right into it. It doesn't establish this like, oh, I gotta go and figure out how to work in this hospital. It does this setup about like picking a hero to focus on in the movie, and they and they're all dressed like Jerry Lewis. They're like conquerors or whatever. And they're all then, played by Jerry. And Lewis. then they pick the guy that works in a hospital, and it's like. And there we go. He's just in this yeah. fucking hospital. And he wants to be a doctor, but he has some fucking condition. I can't it's remember the name crazy of crazy empathy. What did Dr. Howard mean when she said that you had to leave medical school because of your neurotic identification empathy? Well, that's just a fancy way of saying I'm overly sensitive to someone that has pain. It's, it's nothing more than uh, sympathy pains. Everybody gets them, but it's bad for a doctor. Much like in The Ladies' Man, what's the worst job a guy in that state can have? It's running a hotel full of women when, that he's repulsed by. And what is, now, this guy who has... Neurotic identification empathy. 
like a psych psych neurotic identification empathy psycho empathy to where when people describe their medical ailments that he literally feels them you probably shouldn't work in a hospital but this guy wants to be a doctor yes. but he can't be a doctor because of this condition even though it could still affect his job even if he's not a doctor working in a hospital yes but at least he's not in charge of treating people he's the guy that rolls you around gets you some sunshine yeah he he takes the laundry he delivers the lunch mm-hmm. and he listens to stories of the pain that you're in and and he and, of and, course and co-ops it emotionally. absolutely ridiculous you know you get the the crazy big faces and the pulling your body around but much like in the ladies man it seems to conveniently fade out as the movie keeps going it's all about the zany the nuttiness it's all mm-hmm. about nutting and so there's one point where he's going to I fix you said it's all about nutting is that what i said yeah i think so <laughs> that's what it's all about <laughs> so there's this snotty lady because this is like a hody toady sanitarium hospital right and he go and he wants this lady Wants her TV fixed. Did you want me to fix your set? It's about time. Look at that TV set. Oh, well, uh, th- there's nothing really terribly wrong. It's, uh... I'm here for a rest. To cure my exposure. This is a minor To adjust- forget about my fifth husband. Yeah. And I think the joke is that the fuzz is supposed to be like snow. So he opens up the TV and snow starts to blow. This is... He is warped. He's warping reality around Absolutely. him. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's just snow coming into this room. Gusts from of wind. Out, from out of the TV. And no one is calling any government agencies or anything after this. this no, it's they, like knocking people over. This is some extreme paranormal activity that just occurred in this hospital. Yes. At one point, he light his fingers on fire and he's just staring at it. And it's like this huge cartoon flame that's like way big. This is, he's the scariest. You remember the Twilight Zone episode where the kid could do anything? Oh, that's one of the scariest. And ones. they're all freaking out. Yeah. He's that kid, but he doesn't know he's that kid, right? And he's, and he's a sweet guy, so he's not going to be evil like that kid, but he's dumb, dumb enough to have no idea what's going on. This is also a movie. And as soon as we it met is a her, movie. Mm-hmm, this is also. A story in which, from the beginning, a woman is interested yeah. in Jerry Lewis. And they have a dating relationship. They kiss at one point early on. She's so into him, and no one else really understands Julie, why. Julie, right? Isn't it uh, Karen Sharp as Julie? Yes, I believe so. She's she's very pretty. She's yeah. got dark hair. Like She's such a sweetie. She's a nurse. Mm. And she wants to be with him. And like I said, they date, but he feels like he's not complete. And he's going to the therapist at this place. Because like you said, it's a sanatorium and a hospital. So rich people just go there to relax sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or to retire even, it seems like. Yeah, you want to retire to sanitarium. He goes to the psychiatrist like every day. And they're working on why he has this empathy problem. And... He feels that he has to get that fixed before he can move on with anything in his life. He has to clear himself of empathy. You know, it made me think (laughs) of the delinquent movie because there's that part where he tells the girl. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing right now. When I'm something, something, I'll come see you when I'm something. You know, it's kind of that that attitude without saying it. But the psychiatrist thinks that his issue is something related to a lost love or a love problem yes his he lost he did lose we get a flashback he does lose a girlfriend he didn't lose a girlfriend or, he had a crush on a girl that he right, never right. S- fucking spoke to right. she doesn't know who he is now karen sharp is pretty very pretty i i prefer brunettes yeah but when uh but when they cart susan oliver into this hospital who was the green lady in star trek and uh i i, I got to maybe hot or green yeah <laughs> <laughs> the, the, just looking up her, her uh, credentials and seeing that image of her in Star Trek as the green woman, it, it still does something to me. Mm-hmm. I think it affected me when, when I first saw it as a kid. And there's something about it. Like, it still 
does it? Why? <laughs> I like green chicks, man. <laughs> But yeah, she's pretty she's pretty iconic in that role. So mm-hmm. when you see Susan Oller, even though she's not green, it's like that's who that fucking lady is. In this, she is a we find out a housewife who has taken a bunch of pills in a suicide attempt. They found her in a third rate flop house, I believe they mm-hmm. describe it. And the person they're with died, apparently. And so, oh, I remember that part. And even though this is for hody toady people, they bring this lady in and she's kind of in a short coma yeah they basically the administrator who again loves jerry lewis because she was in love with his father when they were young that part's kind of weird but it she just has this she's deferential to him but they she says like why did you bring her here and they say well she's gonna die and this was the closest hospital this man is hurting people and this lady is like overlooking a lot to keep this guy around because when she sees him she sees the love that she lost. <laughs> oh, another reality warping scene is when he goes and has spaghetti dinner with Julie and he manages to, to roll the entire plate of pasta onto his hand. And then he like takes it off like it's a glove. That's also the dinner where she confronts him because when the blonde lady came into the hospital, he like fell in love on sight. She was... In a coma. He leaves a note to a comatose lady he doesn't talk to telling her that he loves her. Yes, because apparently her suicide letter said there's no point living without love. And so he left her this note that said, you don't have to live without love. I love you and admire her. And he knows her name. And and no one else does. Yeah, he knows her name. And, you know, the nurse, his nurse, Julie, is like, you knew her name before anybody. You left her this note. You don't want to be with me because I snooped. I followed. She was trying to get to being able to tell him she knew. Yeah. But it, I love the way she kind of set it up. She was like, you shouldn't date me because I'm not honest because I followed you and read your note. But also, like, what the fuck? You know? Yeah, yeah. And he's like. No, it's straight up creepy. It is. It is. That, yeah, it's more creepy that he did that than that she read the note. Yeah, because, for sure. Because he shouldn't have been in her room. As soon as he walked in her room, he walks in her room a couple times. This is he like. stares at her when she's asleep once, and I truly was like, fired. It's like You're when, fired. It's like when someone in a relationship catches someone cheating in text, and then they come back, and then it's like, uh, what are you doing looking at my text? But no, it was both. That was bad. How analogy. is that? Well, no, it kind of is, because it's like, kind how of. is that? They That's not as bad. They didn't hold as it against cheating. each other, but it kind of felt like that kind of a combo. Well, because they have this weird moment where he tries to tell her, like, "But I care about you," and she's like, "But m- help me understand this." And he's like, "I don't understand it." Like he can't, he won't tell her. But then we get a flashback of him seeing Susan when they he, were young. How could this man understand anything? They when went reality to the same is high school. Around him? Yeah, exactly. He did. He ended up. He did know who this Susan was. We went to the same high school. The day that he decided to go talk to her, she was like the head cheerleader. He decides to go talk to her after a game. There's a ridiculous part where he's got these pom-poms that are huge. And he's like beating this woman over the head basically the whole time while he's cheering. That was also a crazy, because she's just like. He, yeah, he practiced at home. <laughs> and uh, oh, he sees her kissing a man. Very similar to the last movie, although he did not have a relationship with yeah, her. Yeah, nothing. She didn't even know who he was. She didn't even know, but he was going to talk to her, and he saw them kissing, and he that was enough broke to, his heart. And that gave him his weird empathy. Neurotic identification empathy. Yeah, which really doesn't make not? any sense, but fine. And so he tries to talk to her, and she's a bitch to him. I mean, why would why I would? She shouldn't be. She should be a bitch well, to this guy. She doesn't need He's to weird. be. Well, until she catches him coming in her room, then like fuck him, right? Yeah. But at first, he's just trying to be like, "Hi, how are you today?" She could at least just be like, "I'm fine." Thanks. She's Goodbye. a snob at first, but she is. But when she knows that he left the note, when that that it was him. Go- then she kind of tells him off and tells him he's a giant creep. Yeah, and she tells everyone who'll listen that he's yeah. a giant creep. And she's like, he should be fired. But everyone around is like, you should, he really likes you, you know. And then He and was just trying to be nice. Turns out she needs, like, it, of course, this is a where rich people go. So they're trying to kick her out because she has no money. And she's d- not with her old husband anymore. But she needs months of treatment. So that's when... Um, by the way, Jerry Lewis's name is Jerome Littlefield. Jerome, 
then works overtime day after day after day to, to pay for her vi- her visit. But he doesn't want anyone to tell her. And he eventually gets fired because he's so tired and he's trying to paint something and working doing all these menial jobs. And he spills this paint on the guy who owns the hospital. He fires him. Mr. Tuff, Mr. Tuffington. Oh, yeah. He's real tough, Mr. Tuffington. The psych- real tough. The psychiatrist at one point while Susan Albert's going off on what a creep Jerome is, rightfully so. The psychiatrist is like, well, he has been uh, taking care of you. Yeah, he Uh, tells the whole story to her. He bought your fucking ass, bitch. And then this weird (laughs) thing happens where he's ready to leave. Yeah. And he's got on his suit and he's got his suitcases because apparently he lives at the hospital. And he's ready to leave. And she has this dress on and she meets him on the sidewalk and she's like... You can have me. Yeah. No one's ever been nice to me, but you are nice, and you did this for me, and no one's ever done anything like that for me, and so if you'll have me, you can have me. And he tells her, basically in that moment, that they've known each other since high school, even though she didn't remember him, and they kiss, and they kiss like four or five times, but he it's not He has to happening. make sure that he's not, and he's not in love with her, and that's when he realizes, and I actually kind of like this, I do too. that he actually loves Julie, the brunette that's been pining for him the whole time. Except Julie and the curmudgeon, formerly Katie the cook, sees them kissing, and Julie leaves. She's on the way to the airport. She's quit. She's going home to live with her parents because he's broken her heart. So he... This part is insane. Mr. Tuffington, he gets injured. He ends up in the back of an ambulance. And then something happens to where he's trying to leave and the ambulance. No, he's driving the ambulance to go find Julie. He doesn't know that Mr. Tuffington, the guy who runs the hospital, is in the back of the ambulance. Mr. Tuffington, what are you doing there? Stop this ambulance immediately! You can't yell at me, I'm fired. You're, you're hired again! Does that go for Dr. Howard too? Yes, she's hired again. Now stop this ambulance immediately! Yes, sir. These are Ghostbuster style ambulances. And he and something happens to where Mr. Tuffington pops out the back of the ambulance on a rolling gurney, and then it's like ten minutes of like a chase. This was great. It was great. I the last ten minutes, like I had no issue with like it was fun to watch them just madcap it run was, around. It was just insane. Watching Mr. Tuffington roll around and then in the whole chaos of all of this, that's when Jerome and um Julie finally do get back together and they get their jobs back at the hospital when they negotiate it with Mr. Tuffington at some point. Like it's all crazy madcap, but yeah. But God is, it's Mr. Tuffington that God is punishing yes. by sending Jerome, yes. Jerry Lewis well, down to work man. here. Julie and Jerome come together. It's like we forgot about Mr. Tuffington. He's been rolling down the street on a gurney the whole time. And then the end of the movie shows him rolling down to a pier. Mr. Tuffington flies off into the water. God is destroyed. Mr. Tuffington and uh, the work of uh, the the chaos agent Jerome Littlefield is done. My favorite supernatural thing that happens in this movie, this is something to do with the plot, but he is walking a man out into the courtyard who is in a full body cast. And he walks this man out to the courtyard and he's like, I'm going to get you a chair. You just wait right here. And it's not even, it's, it's truly like every bit of his body is a cast. Yeah. Before Jerome can get him in the seat, the man falls and he rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls through people and across roads and down hills and past trees. And he finally drums, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you. It's a very long sequence also, but he's running, 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 drums jumping over people. And then the cast hits a tree and breaks into a bunch of pieces and there's no man. And he's like picking up the foot bit like yelling like where are you are you in there gone jerome somehow transported his body who knows off to some other dark dimension who knows where this broken man is trapped in some realm that he doesn't belong he's in one of those spa pools in halloween too and jerome doesn't even know he's doing this yeah it's disturbing this is like a science fiction film yeah 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 there's one part where in the crazy madcapness of it all there's some a bunch of shit falling down in a grocery store and there's one point where 
a mountain of cans falls and like you said it I exposed see. like people were inside of the mountain of That's cans right. it it's truly insane no this this is it's Jerome Littlefield's world and we're all just puppets mm-hmm. we're all puppets in this fucking world that's the disorderly orderly from 1964 uh, a fascinating study in um and uh an idiot god that doesn't know he's a god and i stand by that interpretation it might be the interpretation for the majority of all jerry lewis movies actually yeah so especially one as zany as this one um, but you're going to give this one through five. I'm going to give this one through five combined for best out of 10. I think this is, it got me thinking of things on another level. I felt like I understood Jerry a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I won't say it's like the type of humor that really gets me going, but there is something about this movie and the implications are horrifying. Yes. I'm going to give it a 3.5. I'm giving it a 3.25. That is a 6.75. That is our highest rated. They go up a little bit more every time. Take a look at it, folks. At 6.75, snugged sweetly. No, it's at the bottom of (laughs) 6.75, right under Hotel Transylvania and The Birds. The Disorderly Orderly is at least as good as those movies. Also, only two other movies are on this list. Everything Everywhere All at Once and Border. So this movie is at least as good as those movies. If not better. A couple other reality bending films. That's true. Some reality. Yeah, there's just some some strange shit going on in the 6.75. <laughs> Check the shows for links. Other places to find us. Uh, we, uh, we've we got a new link now. If you take a look where it links to our little free website where you can go see the scores that we've made for the movies. And where, they, where they've been updated at so far. We do shift them around from time to time. And uh, also, um, like and subscribe and leave comment corrections. You like your Jerry Lewis movies? I kind of I kind of thought this one was pretty good, but there were just things about it. it I, I, I maybe thought about it in a way that's different. Mm-hmm. Some might say I overthought it, but I think I'm really on to something here. So what did you think about it? What's your favorite Jerry Lewis movie? Anyway, that's it for our Jerry Lewis this month. Bon voyage. I, I wouldn't mind talking about more Jerry Lewis in the future. It doesn't bother me. Sure. I'm. I just. I. I feel more curious about the man. But uh, that said, uh, we will go more flops for the rest of the month. Justice for Ishtar. Ishtar.